Good evening, Fellowship High Crest. And so, you know, I've been at home taking care of kids. You may hear them destroying things upstairs. And Josiah had come over to help me out with some of the kids. And so we were just spending some time having some worship. And we wanted to do this video for you. So as Jill gets ready to take us into the next couple of chapters of Hosea, we're just going to pave the way for that with some worship. So I want you to take some time to just orient your heart towards Christ as we sing about our good, good Father. There are a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night and tell that you're pleasing that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, as you know, just what we need before we say your word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. today, Lord, as we prepare to listen to your word. We thank you, Lord, that you look at us with our imperfections, Lord, with our sin, and Lord, where we have turned our hearts away from you, Lord, and yet you still see the beauty of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you are indeed a good father. Lord, as we get ready to dig into Hosea again, and Jill brings your word, I pray, Lord, that you just open up our hearts, Lord, and that you speak clearly in our community groups and in this time that we have set aside to learn more about you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. We give you all the praise. And we say amen. amen. All right, brothers and sisters. Passing it off to Jill for our midweek major in the minors. Good evening, Fellowship Highcrest fam. I'm so excited to be with you tonight. Um, we are going to jump into Hosea, um, our second week of Hosea. I love this book. Um, it's probably one of my favorites growing up, and um, it's one of those quirky, weird places in the Bible um, that we don't talk about a lot, so I'm really excited to get to join in with you tonight. 
Um, so we're going to be in Hosea chapters 2 and 3. I'm going to do it a little bit differently. I'm not going to read every single verse of 2 and 3. Um, it's a bit long. Uh, I'm going to kind of take some chunks out. And if you guys want to go back in your groups and read the whole thing together, I mean, I really encourage you to do that. So last week, Jonathan talked about um, what it means to be in relationships that we're really just struggling and it's difficult, whether that's at home or at work, um, it's with our friends, our family, uh, coworkers, wherever that may be. Um, what does it mean to be able to show forgiveness and hold people accountable um, and just what that hard work means and, and how we can look at that through the lens of what we learn in Hosea and we learn about God. Um, and we're always wanting to go back to scripture and find out like, what does God say about how to do this? What does God say about how to walk through relationships that are hard and struggling? I think Jose is a great example. Um, you know, as we're reading through this, we might come across some stuff that is difficult in these passages. And I get that, like um, the way God describes um, punishment in these passages or the way Jose may have treated his wife it may feel like it doesn't quite fit the the crime, like the punishment doesn't fit the crime. But, you know, in that culture, in that day, it was, it was absolutely right on point. Like Hosea had the right... Um, to divorce his wife. I mean, she had left him. He had the right in that culture and under their laws to have her killed even. And so the shock and awe value of this story for the audience that was listening was that that's not what Hosea chose. And in the end, it's not what God chose for his people either. So as we're reading chapter two and three, you're going to see it kind of loop in and out of telling Hosea's story and then how God is responding to Israel. Um, and you'll, you might feel like, are we talking about Hosea right now or are we talking about God? Like what's, who's talking and how is it being applied? And it's because God is really wanting to show his people through the life of Hosea how he wants to live and pursue and love them and what he expects of them. So um, we are going to look at um, chapter 2, verses 2, um, sorry, we're going to look at 6 through 8 here in a second, but, you know, this first section, 2 through 13, is really about um, what God would allow his people to experience, the consequences of leaving him. Um, you know, his first commandment was that they have him only as their God, that he was the one true God and they pursued him and their commitment was to him, like no one else, no other gods besides him. And that's the one that they broke frequently and often. And it's the one that broke God's heart. He said, I want you to depend on me. I want you to find your sustenance and everything from me. And they would go after whatever God was in the land or whatever God um, that their neighbors might have, if it was going to win them favor with them. And so it really broke God's heart and he allowed them to experience the consequences. So I'm going to read verses 6 through 8 for you real quick. It says, For this reason, I will fence her in with thorn bushes. I will block her path with a wall to make her lose her way. When she runs after her lover, she won't be able to catch them. She will search for them, but not find them. Then she will think, I might as well return to my husband, for I was better off with him than I am now. She doesn't realize it was I who gave her everything she has, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold, but she gave all my gifts to, the, to Baal. So like, it's just this image of God saying, you know what, she, Israel is thinking that she's getting everything that she has from these other nations, um, from her neighbors, um, that that's where she's going to get uh, her sustainability from, even from other gods. And he's saying, I'm going to block it and I'm going to stop it so that she remembers that it's better with me. Um, and so like Hosea, God had every right to abandon and leave Israel. I mean, Israel didn't keep up their end of the bargain. Like they didn't keep the covenant. And so he didn't have to keep his, but he wouldn't do it. He could, um, he just wouldn't because he's God. And that's not in his character. He didn't abandon or reject them. Um, he pursued them and he brought them back to him and he restored his covenant with them. I'm going to read this part of chapter two. Um, it's just very beautiful the way God pursues his people. I'm going to start in verse 14. Um, it says, but then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and I will speak tenderly to her there. Um, other translation says, I will allure her um, into the desert. 
says, I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She will, be, she will give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O oh, Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips and you will never mention them again. Um, on that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground so that they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so that you can live unafraid in peace and safety. All right, so catch this. We're going to read verses 19 and 20 next. Um, this is where God renews his covenant with his people. Um, he renews his promises with Israel um, and their marriage vows. Like these are things that we would say in a wedding to our spouse. It says, I will make you my wife forever showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. And you will finally know me as the Lord. And that day I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the sky as it pleads for clouds. And the sky will answer the earth with rain. Um, the earth will answer the thirsty cries of the grain, the grapevines and the olive trees. And then in turn will answer Jezreel. God plants. Um, at that time, I will plant a crop of Israelites and raise them for myself. I will show love to those called not loved. And to those I called not my people, I will say, now you are my people. And they will reply, you are our God. Okay, I'm going to stop reading right here. Chapter three is next. And it's just a retelling of God asking Hosea to bring his wife back to him. And Hosea had to buy her back, um, which meant that she had sold herself um, to begin with. And just the destitution of where that relationship was and um, what Hosea had to restore and what God had to restore. Um, chapter three also explains that God's relationship with Israel will work the same way. He's going to bring his people back. He's going to win them back. Um, and this is all part of a redemptive cycle that we see over and over again in the Bible, where um, it just keeps playing out from the beginning until Jesus. Uh, we see it in Noah. We see it in the judges. We see it while the Israelites are wandering around out in the wilderness. We see it in all of the prophets, including Hosea. Um, and in Hosea's own life, um, God starts with relationship with people. His people <laughs> rebel against him. They live in the consequences, the punishment, um, the exile, whatever that may be. The people repent. They remember, ah, oh, things were better with God. Um, and then God redeems and forgives and restores. And unfortunately, then the cycle starts over again. <laughs> um, and it goes, and we see it over and over again until we get to Jesus. Um, and God says, you know what? I'm going to give you the one final restitution. I'm going to give you the, the, the one thing that's going to stop and break the cycle. And, you know, when you step over that line of faith and you say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus. Like, I believe everything that I know to be true about him. And um, what we get in return is that promise of ultimate restoration that we don't have to keep repeating this cycle over and over again. And yes, while we're on this tide of eternity and on this side of life, like, we're going to repeat that as, um, you know, you're going to sin and you're going to confess your sin and you're going to repent from it and um, you're going to receive forgiveness. But um, our ultimate relationship with God is, is final. Like we know where we stand if we've stepped over that line of faith. Um, and it's that, that beautiful promises that we read in verses 19 and 20 of this is what God promises to us. He promises compassion. He promises to be with us forever um, and justice and, and loving kindness. And so as you get ready to discuss in your groups um, the story of Hosea and his wife and God and his people, um, and you're looking through chapters two and three and, and reflecting on them, I have some questions for you. Um, what really stood out to me this time was verses 19 and 20 from, chapters, from chapter two. So I want you to share with your group a time that you have known these promises to be true. So read those promises that are in, in 19 and 20 reflect on them. When have they been true for you? Um, can you share a story about that? Um, can you share a story about how you know God has fulfilled those commitments to you? 
right? And then on the flip side, when is a time that you've struggled to believe those promises? Is that time right now? Are you still struggling to believe that God is forever faithful, um, that he wants compassion and justice for you? Um, and walk through that. So if, if reflect on a time when that's been a struggle for you, and if it's a struggle right now, how can your group pray for you? And then just my last question is kind of a follow-up from last week. You know, we talked about those, those relationships that we might be struggling with and how can we hold um, accountability and forgiveness and balance with one another. So if you shared a story last week or you were thinking about a story of a relationship, um, has anything changed in the last week? You know, do you have something that you can share with your group about what God has been working in you um, or maybe in that other person? And if not, like, how can your group continue to pray for you in those relationships? All right, thanks for joining us tonight. Continue to power up, pour in, and spill out.